So a lot of people compare Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin today in 2015 to the internet of 1994. And so there are really funny news clips. You can watch Peter Mansbridge, Peter Mansbridge uh, talk about describing this thing called the internet. The growing phenomenon of internet. 1994, that sounded crazy. Um, and so today we're here, about, we're here to talk about Bitcoin and, uh, and what it's going to look like in the next 20 years. So I've assembled you know, a great panel of speakers. Uh, Gerald Cotton, uh, the founder of Quadriga CX, which just yesterday became Canada's largest Bitcoin exchange. On all your whole merit, right? It's all you, Then we have Anthony Diorio, uh, founder of Decentral. He actually has a lot of companies. He's involved massively in the Bitcoin space. Uh, I'll let him get into that. Uh, we have Alex Yanis, a software engineer at Coinbase. Uh, and then we have William McGuire, uh, founder of Startup Management. Um, and you know he's been writing a lot about Bitcoin and how it's going to uh, shape the next two decades on the internet. So, Gerald, starting with you. Yes. What's your story? You were born, now you're here. What happened in between? <laughs> So I've been involved in a number of digital currencies over the years and payment processors. And when Bit came, Bitcoin came around, it was completely different than anything I'd ever seen before. Usually when you'd have an online payment processor, it'd be like PayPal, where you have a centralized ledger that's maintained by a large corporation. With Bitcoin, you basically get rid of that large corporation. So I was really, really fascinated with that technology. But one of the hardest parts about Bitcoin was acquiring the Bitcoin. When you're dealing with a company like PayPal, you just make a PayPal account and then you fund it with your, you just hook up your bank account and get money in your PayPal account. However, with Bitcoin, it was very, very hard, especially in Canada, to go about doing that. So I created Quadriga CX in 2013, and we basically are now the largest exchange in Canada for buying and selling Bitcoin. Congratulations. Thanks. Anthony. What, how, how long have you been involved in the space? What was your aha moment? Why Bitcoin? I got into Bitcoin in 2012. It was in the summer. I'd heard about it on a radio station on a show that was talking about uh, freedom and liberty. And they were talking about how they kept mentioning Bitcoin and Bitcoin. And I started digging into it. And the first day I heard about it, actually, I went in and purchased Bitcoin. So I got it off local Bitcoins in Toronto. I found somebody that was selling Bitcoins. And I bought my first Bitcoin at about $11. Um, over the next six weeks, I didn't sleep very much. It was completely intriguing how the system of uh, currency with a fixed and limited supply, getting away from how we have governments now creating and printing more and more money, which devalues what we all have in our bank accounts, which is called inflation, uh, without knowing what exactly they're going to do uh, with the money supply. And being able to have a, a currency that's actually dictated by mathematics and algorithms. Um, so I can know 10, 20, 30 years in a, in, ahead how many Bitcoins will be out there. So it gives me an idea to know um, how many Bitcoins I want to buy, how much I will have, and what the money su will supply will be down the road. And that's what completely intrigued me about, about Bitcoin. So I purchased Bitcoin in 2012. About a month later, I started the Toronto Bitcoin Meetup. Uh, we've been going since, since summer 2012. Uh, we've been weekly doing meetups for the last year and a half. Um, I founded the Bitcoin Alliance of Canada, which is a national nonprofit organization in Canada. Uh, we put on the Bitcoin Expo last year at the Metro Toronto Convention Center. I founded Decentral, which is a space where we work on decentralized applications and decentralized technology. And the key to what Bitcoin is and the key to the technology is decentralization. Decentralization brings across, um, it removes central points of failure, it removes costs, it removes third party which takes cuts from everything that we do in this world including banks and credit cards. And it's sensor proof, it can't be shut down. And I, I kind of take it like we had with Napster back in the day. People that know Napster was a, a file sharing system that was centralized. And then we came up with BitTorrent. So Napster got shut down because they could shut it down. With, with BitTorrent, you can't shut it down. And that's where we are with our currency, and that's where we are with our systems these days, with just decentralization. 
So in the future, I believe everything will be decentralized. I believe that right now we don't have the tools to make everything decentralized, but in the future it will be. And I think it's at the end of the day for consumers and people that are transacting, not just with currency, which is what Bitcoin is, it's going well beyond that right now. Um, people are going to be free to transact person to person without having to, to make these third party um, payments to other entities which, you know, I, I want to have a deal with someone, I want to have a contract with somebody, I can do it individually without having to actually pay third parties. And decentralization is the key for what I want to do. I love it. I think you're jumping a bit ahead and I want to get to those other applications later. Uh, but very excited to talk about that. Alex, I actually think you're the youngest person on the panel. Uh, did that I mean you so. got involved the earliest no, uh, or the latest or I don't know? What did uh, you see in Bitcoin? Possibly, I'm not sure. Um, I first got involved in Bitcoin in about um, April of 2011. Um, at the time, I was, I was living in New York and uh, I was playing um, poker at an underground card room in Hell's Kitchen. And, <laughs> You're really um, playing up the stereotype of Bitcoin. <laughs> I, know, I know, right, yeah. I probably fit the stereotype the best, but... Um, uh, I forget exactly which day it was in April of 2011, but the, uh, the FBI seized the domain names of the largest poker sites at the time, Full Tilt Poker and PokerStars.com, and my friends at the poker room, um, they had tens and tens of thousands of dollars on these sites, and they weren't sure how they were going to pay their rent and so on. And actually, the way that the law in the United States works is that it's not illegal to gamble online. It's illegal for payment processors to process payments for online gambling. And that was when I first got into Bitcoin um, because I realized it was a way around these restrictions that the United States government placed on online gambling. Um, and also separately, um, the, the, math the mathematics underlying Bitcoin uh, were, were actually a huge breakthrough. So when I first started university, um, there was something called the Byzantine Generals problem. I'm not going to get into it, but it was an unsolved problem in mathematics. And in 2011, I mean, in, in 2009, when Bitcoin came out, he actually solved an unsolved problem in mathematics. I thought, look, this is a currency that will let me gamble online. And the guy's a genius. He solved like a, a math problem that was thousands of years old. That um, is like super nerdy. And I love sorry. it. <laughs> but no, like all I want you to all know right now is we've assembled the smartest crew of people. And we haven't even heard from William yet. William. Thanks. So not only am I the older person on this panel, I also got in the latest after you guys, but I'm a fast learner. Uh, I got in about a year uh, ago, a bit more than a year ago. The first time I heard about Bitcoin was on Fred Wilson's blog uh, about two years ago where I'm a frequent commentator. And then it was just a curiosity at the time. But then uh, if you remember in December 2013, we had this big ice storm here in Toronto and some people didn't have any power. We didn't have power for six days, but we kind of hunkered down at, at home, and then I started to read everything I could get my hands on about Bitcoin, literally for six days between getting power from batteries and whatever. And then it dawned on me that this was a big thing, that it kind of reminded me a lot to what happened with the internet back in 94, uh, where I was involved in the internet days uh, from day one as well. Uh, there was an organization at the time called CommerceNet, which was the equivalent of the Bitcoin Foundation. And I was the chairman of CommerceNet in Canada. So I did see how the internet started. And I saw a lot of analogies with uh, what is going on with Bitcoin. Uh, it is not just a currency, as you will hear more about that from us. Uh, it is also a development platform. Uh, it is a network. Uh, it is uh, a very powerful thing that gives a lot of chances for a lot of us to reinvent things uh, personally, business-wise. Uh, it's really uh, hopefully the beginning of something that is very exciting. Uh, it, it may take 5, 10, 20 years, 15 years for us to, to see the full uh, evolutionary impact of, of Bitcoin. And we're very much in the early, early days at this point. So there was a Wired article, uh, and you know, there's this quote from there. Instead of running from Bitcoin, we should uh, commandeer it from the radicals and make it work for the rest of us. Um, that seems like, a, I think that fits pretty well with what we're trying to achieve today and figure out like what can it be used for. So Anthony, you said, I first heard about it at some freedom. Like, why, why are people thinking that it's like radical people that want to overthrow the government? that are involved in Bitcoin? So first thing is that Bitcoin cannot be commandeered. 
nobody can actually uh, take it and do what they want with it. It's a open protocol. Um, anybody can use it, but you really can't change it. So what do you think the most uh, like, like logical next use for it is? Like what, what can it really revolutionize? So, so Bitcoin is a payment platform. It's actually a way to send value instantly anywhere in the world for zero cost, if you want. Actually, and that's the major focus of it. Would you agree that, that Bitcoin will be more uh, important uh, than the internet as a whole? I don't think Bitcoin will. I think the technology behind Bitcoin will. Uh, Bitcoin is an example of the technology. The blockchain itself is the genius behind the technology. It's not Bitcoin itself. And now we're seeing that it's not just about sending value and me, you being able to say that, yeah, I've received it. You're starting to see these other technologies come out of, now that we have this proven technology behind Bitcoin that can be involved in so many other spaces that are not just about sending value from one person to the other. It's gonna be involved with making contracts between me and other individuals. It, you can have actual property that's set up on the blockchain that can be proven without needing third parties involved. You can have marriage contracts that are set on the blockchain right now. So it's really expanding behind payments. And that, that is not the, when you, when you have got governments now trying to regulate the way payments are done, anything, they've got no idea what is coming because of this technology. And that's the most important thing is, it, it, it's, it, it's a good example of what Bitcoin has done, but what's going beyond Bitcoin is the stuff that I'm focused on. And that's what I think is the most important elements of it. Okay, so can someone explain to me how a contract could work in the, bit, in the uh, blockchain? At its core, the, the Bitcoin technology, um it, it, it's just a, you know, it's just a list of who owns what, and it, it's a list of this person has this many bitcoins, or this person has that many bitcoins. Um, but the, there's no reason why we can't uh, leverage the underlying technology. And instead of saying this person owns this many bitcoins, you could say this person owns that condo, or these two people are married, or any other um, sort of contract that needs to be uh, put in the. Um, in the public sphere and needs to be public and and right now the way that we solve that problem is you have to go down to the the county you know the town courthouse and you need to pay lawyers and there's a bunch of people there and then you move a bunch of dead trees around and they get filed away in some library and and you know later if you want to have a lawsuit they get to go to that library and say oh no that that's the person that owns that condo and this is just a, a I mean effectively it's, it's just a more efficient method of recording who owns what in a public fashion electronically very cheaply. Yeah. Gerald. Just, just. With Alex's example, when you own a property, for example, you go down to the local courthouse and they maintain all of those records, and that's the central authority that maintains everything. No one can check those records without going to the courthouse and getting that information and probably paying a fee to see that information. With Bitcoin, it's all in the public sphere. Anyone can check it, anyone can verify it. If I say I own something, Alex can prove it, Anthony can prove it, anyone can prove it just by looking on the internet. And this is probably how things are going to go in the future in terms of ownership, not just of money and bitcoins, but everything. So now it's, okay, sorry, William. Sorry. I, just, I just wanted to clarify that point because you said everything is open on the internet. It's kind of open, but not really open. Here's the analogy I want to give. It's like, if I know your home address, Jonathan, your home address is, is public, right? but it doesn't give me any information about what's inside of your house, unless you give me the key, right? You, 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 can, you only have your key to the house, and if you show up at your house and you, you put the key in the door, then you can go in, and if you let me in with you, then I can see what's inside. So it's kind of that concept with, the, with Bitcoin, and the, there's this thing of public key, private key, so you kind of need a public key. The public key is like the address, like when you publish that, uh, that number there, that is like, that. okay, I have the address. What doesn't tell me about your home? Nothing. All I know is it's the street it's on. I can prove it's yours. You can prove it's yours. So but I know nothing about what's inside. I have they, to could deliver they could give me mail. That's it. They, they leave it outside. It. But I need the key to go inside and see it. So. It, it's, it's basically proof of ownership is what it is. Gerald can prove that he is actually married to someone, but... The person looking to get in, like, they can send a challenge to him and say, Gerald, I want you to prove that. And Gerald can actually say, by signing a transaction with his private key, with no matter what it is, a contract or a payment, he can prove that he owns that, and he can then, you know, attest to the challenge that is given to him. So he proves ownership without somebody actually knowing and having to know his identity. And that's the key thing. Or 
What's that? Without a third party. Yeah, without a third party actually being involved in the transaction as well. So I, I you it's know, privacy I've... without giving away what you want to give away. But you know, we do live in a world where there are legal systems, and I've heard Alex say before that if courts don't recognize these contracts, then they just don't matter. So are there any obstacles with you know, the current regulatory systems and the legal systems that we have to work around? Although the technology is there to assign um, ownership on the blockchain uh, based on the Bitcoin technology, um, it really doesn't mean much if, um, I, mean, I mean, if you break into my house and you claim that it's yours and I point at the blockchain and say, no, that house is mine, um, that's only useful if I can take that information on the blockchain and convince a judge to order some cops to remove you from my house. Um, I mean, effectively, the, the, the power at the end, somebody needs to go in with guns and get you out of my house because it's mine. And so until we have legal recognition of um, ownership that's reflected in the blockchain, it doesn't, it doesn't have real impact um, outside of, you know, internet. Actually, zeros and ones bringing up legal as well so you know there's a reason Gerald why you are now Canada's largest uh, Bitcoin exchange uh, do you care to tell the story what happened to the former largest Bitcoin exchange um, they just cited a variety of reasons banking troubles legal troubles and so forth it, it, it not necessary. It's not necessarily linked to them. We don't really know why they've shut down. They've just given a very vague answer, legal, banking, and so forth. We'll probably find out a lot more about them in the coming days. But as a result of them shutting down, it's been great for me. Yes. <laughs> I just want to say something to add to the last question, which is the, the thing that uh, I want to give a warning to, have, to all of us is that we should not be hyping what is going to happen with Bitcoin. Because if you go back in history, and I've been there, uh, if you remember the dot-com crash in the year 2000, and it happened because we, some people started to hype the internet. And some people wanted the internet to get to wherever it was going a lot faster than it was really going. So I'm, I'm worried that the same thing might happen with Bitcoin. So is Bitcoin going to change the world? Yes. But when, I cannot tell you when. It's not for next year. It's going to take a few years. So back to the examples, we have to kind of walk before we can run in terms of applications of Bitcoin and the blockchain. And maybe it starts with very simple applications like moving money, we just saw that. That's a very simple application. Then you talk about smart contracts, but again, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's do something very simple like doing a wager, a wager, like a bet. I can do a bet, let's say, uh, that, the, that the Raptors are going to win on Friday and bet, uh, whatever, one Bitcoin between me and Anthony. And then that's it. I'll just put that contract on the blockchain. Uh, hopefully, Ethereum will be, allow us to do that in an easy way. And that's it. I forget about it. Then whoever wins, automatically, either I get one Bitcoin or Anthony gets one Bitcoin automatically. This is a very simple example. So here we have copied something. But then later on, the more sophisticated applications will come, which will be the new stuff. And we didn't have a lot of new stuff on the internet for a few years. We were started to copy stuff first. And so I just want to warn us all. So let's, let's walk before we can run. If you don't have a Bitcoin wallet, get one as a starting point. Uh, if you don't have uh, 10 bucks to put on, a, on, on Bitcoin, see if there's a way to earn Bitcoins. Like if you have a service, if you... Invoice somebody in bitcoins, so you'll receive a bitcoin or something like that, and then start to walk before you can run. That, that was actually a really good example about the bet. And one of the interesting things about that, uh, Jeff, you were talking about earlier, how do we enforce these contracts? And with Alex's example of someone breaking into your home, you need to have someone who enforces that. However, with the blockchain technology, you could actually write a contract into the actual code. So there is no third party that has to actually enforce the contract. You could set it up so if it's sunny tomorrow, or if you flip a coin, or if something happens, someone wins that bet, and then the actual code itself sends the profits to whoever wins the bet, rather than having, say, the government, which runs a lottery. Right now, they collect all the money, they get the balls, they say so-and-so won. With this, we can actually make it completely automated, get rid of all of the third parties, and make it so it's impossible to tamper with. 
is it impossible to tamper with, or you said, is it sunny tomorrow? Who are we well, checking? Well, Yahoo weather? First, weather first of all, that's what I mean. You need some type of oracle that actually will decide who, if it's sunny tomorrow. Because so you know, you still uh, do need a third party involved in that. Tony Phil. They can't even yeah. agree if spring is like six weeks away. Or, you know, if no, no, that's winter. true. You actually do need trusted third parties still in terms of, of smart contracts in order to decide um, who will make the decision whether or not it's sunny or not. But you can actually then have... Well, it's always sunny in Philadelphia. It is, but know. we ain't there, so it doesn't really matter. Um, so the, the key is that we, we are going to be reducing the amount of third parties, but you still do need trusted oracles which will be give, providing you the information. So you can reduce the third parties taking commissions and cuts, but you definitely still do need people to actually... Can we just call them Google? Can Google tell us what's right and wrong? They could, but you probably don't want to lie on one source. You probably want to lie on multiple sources to get, give you the accurate answer. Decentralized authority. Exactly, yeah. I think at this point, what I want to do... So we could go on for a long time in like what's going to happen in the future. If every single panelist would like to just quickly have a closing thought on uh, where they think Bitcoin's going to go, or the blockchain, or what's going to happen in the future, then we'll open it up to some Q&A. Gerald. So I think we're going to see mainly payment applications over the next few years, and then larger, more broader scale applications like Ethereum in maybe the next five years. We're really going to open the doors to people that just do not have the access to the things that we take for granted right now and uh, really remove these, uh, these, these, these third parties that are just taking these commissions that do not make sense with the technology that we have coming out right now. Oh, sorry. Okay. The way uh, my parting so thoughts would be is to think about this as follows. It's not about Bitcoin. It's not about cryptocurrency. It's not about the blockchain. It's about a new economy that is unraveling in front of us. It's about value creation. So there's this crypto-enabled economy that is going to be emerging because each one of us can earn new value that did not exist before. It is not just about buying Bitcoins and cryptocurrency to put something in your wallet. In the example we just talked about, the transportation, you can loan some processing power on your computer in the near future and earn a fraction of bitcoins because you're loaning that power. You can loan, you can have a decentralized storage. You can loan a part of your drive that is not being used and then earn money as well. And there's gonna be hundreds if not thousands of applications like that where we all are working together in a peer-to-peer -peer manner and generating new value. So think about what's going on as a new economy. In the same way that we have the web economy, we're going to have the crypto-enabled economy. Uh, I mostly agree with uh, uh, Gerald and Anthony that in the, in the next few years at least, um, we'll be seeing increasing applications of, of the payment part of Bitcoin, of, of like the, the Bitcoin currency. Um, and there are a few examples. Um, I know it, it's, it's generally difficult for um, audiences like this one um, comprise mostly of uh, first world uh, well to do people who are you know they have visa cards they have mastercards um, they 're paid and they save money in a currency like the Canadian dollar, which is uh, generally has a stable value and they, and you can trust in the central bank of Canada that uh, your dollar will have roughly the same purchasing power one year from now um, that it does today. But actually, um, that is not true for the majority of the population of the world. There are billions of people in the world who, who live in countries where the central bank uh, regularly uh, prints so much money that they have hyperinflation. Um, there are many peoples in countries where uh, you, you cannot get a, a visa or a MasterCard. And if you do, um, international merchants and e-commerce merchants will refuse to sell to you. For example, if you really are the... Uh, Prince of Nigeria and you have 10 million dollars and you try to go on apple.com and buy yourself a new MacBook They will reject you and you will not be able to buy that MacBook and in that situation <clears throat> Excuse me everyone everyone loses um, Apple loses out on the sale um, The Prince of Nigeria does not get his new MacBook at the same price that the rest of us do and These are all applications that can be solved by Bitcoin um, in the in the very near future uh, That's where I see it going. <laughs> yeah all right, Gerald, uh, Anthony, Alex, and Willie William, thank you so much for participating in the panel tonight. Big round of applause.